This video will discuss the n plus 1 rule for coupling in NMR. So let's say we're looking at a spectrum here. So we have this molecule here, which I suppose would be 112 tribromoethane. So we have a proton here at carbon 1, and we have two protons here at carbon 2. And so these, these two protons are chemically equivalent. So this proton sees two protons for it to interact with and couple with. So it, uh, and it also is, has more groups closer to it that are electron withdrawing, giving it uh, less shielding. So it's at a higher chemical shift. And we have these two protons down there, which are chemically equivalent and each see one proton for them to couple with. So and they have less, uh, they have fewer groups close to them, which are going to uh, deshield them and and push up their chemical shift. So this this set of protons is down here. So what we observe here is that these two protons form what is called a doublet, where we have two peaks of equal magnitude, and this pro and this proton here forms what is called a triplet, where we have these three peaks with the peak in the middle being twice as big. So the question now is what causes this behavior and what can we learn about it in general that we can apply to arbitrary molecules? Okay, so we'll start with the simplest case. That's gonna be a proton that doesn't have any coupling with any other nuclei. So that's what's called a singlet. So we just have a single peak that goes up and goes back down called a singlet. Then the next case is we either have a proton next door or a nucleus which can be spin up or spin down. So the spin up will do have one effect, the spin down will have another. And so the energy levels interact differently giving us the splitting that we saw in our spin-spin coupling video. So if you have one adjacent nucleus that you can couple with, you get two peaks which will be of equal magnitude because it's equally likely that you get one spin up or spin down of that neighboring nucleus. So that gives you this doublet behavior, two peaks of equal magnitude. Okay, the next type of behavior, if we have two adjacent nuclei, we can either have both of those nuclei be spin up, both be spin down, or we can have one spin up and the other spin down. And there's two ways to do that. So since each of these states are pretty much equally likely in our what's called a triplet here, we have one case for two spin ups, one case for two spin downs, and one and two cases in the middle where they're mixed. So that gives us our one to two to one triplet shape that we observed for proton A here. Then this procedure extends indefinitely. We can have three adjacent nuclei, like when you're next to a methyl group and get a quartet where there's one way for all three nuclei to be spin up, one way for all three of them to be spin down, and there's three ways each for two to be up and one to be down, or two to be down and one to be up. Each of those results in different energy transitions and a different peak in our quartet on the spectrum. And then as, you, as this goes further down, the pattern starts to become more clear and we can start to generalize it looking at a quintet where we'd have four adjacent protons, one way for there to be four spin up, four ways for there to be three spin up and one spin down, six ways for there to be two up, two down, four ways for there to be three down, one up, and one way for all four to be down, giving us one to four to six to four to one, the shape of a quintet. So what is it that predicts these types of shapes in general before we have to do this kind of analysis? So one thing we see here is that whenever we have n adjacent protons, whether that's 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, n adjacent protons gives us n plus 1 peaks. So that's where the n plus 1 rule comes from because we see here for A, there are two adjacent protons giving us a triplet. For B, there's one adjacent proton giving us a doublet. So n plus 1 tells us the number of peaks that we get for our specific uh, our specific resonance. And then the magnitude of these peaks is determined by what are called binomial coefficients, which you can get from the mathematical uh, idea called Pascal's triangle. So for a singlet, we'd start up at the top here, write a 1. 
Then going down, we write a number to the left and to the right of a one, and we keep going with ones all the way down the sides of this pyramid. So the external edge of each pyramid is gonna be one. But in the middle, what we do is we look above this particular spot and we add up the two values directly to the left and to the right of that number. So one plus one is two, one plus two is three, two plus one is three, three plus three is six, etc. all the way down the pyramid. So if we wanted to know uh, uh, if we wanted to know what something with six adjacent protons looked like, if we wanted to know what a septet looked like, we would have this row here, one to six to 15 to 20 to 15 to six to one. It starts to get very complicated, but the further you go down this triangle, the more and more things start to look like a uh, Gaussian function. And in fact, a Gaussian function is the limit if you do Pascal's triangle with an infinite number of rows. So the n plus one rule is very useful to us because it tells us things like how many adjacent protons there are to a given proton. So, and the shape of that proton, uh, sorry, the shape of that peak is also determined by uh, the statistics for how many of those adjacent nuclei are likely to be spin up and spin down just giving us one um, further piece of information we can use to determine the structure of our molecule by looking at the information in a proton NMR spectrum.